Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I'm capping my first day back with students for the 2023 school year with an interview with Margaret Peterson Haddix. May I call you Margaret? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. do All not right. go with the whole mouthful. That's like way too much to expect of anybody. <laughs> all right. Well, well no, I, I would totally do it if you if you wanted all three well, names. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Well, well, thank you so much, Margaret, for jumping in and talking with me. And I'll mention uh, among the hidden, of course, is the book that I first discovered, put on my classroom shelf. I don't even remember when this was but I know I was teaching middle school and the sheer amount of traffic that that book received of, you know, middle school hands coming and picking it up and reading it and bringing it back. It, it was really impressive. And of course there's an entire series that goes with that book. There's the missing series as well as running out of time. Um, and so lots of wonderful books. And I'm sure we'll mention a couple of titles that I didn't glimpse in those, but my first question is an origins question, as I tend to do, and that is that initial draw to the written word. What was it that drew you to the world of authoring and creating? Well, I like how you call it an origins question because that <laughs> like a superhero, you know. Absolutely, that, yes. Although maybe I, it could also be supervillain, I guess, because they have origin stories too. But we'll go with the superhero <laughs> approach. Um, for me, I was drawn to the written word because I was lucky enough to live in a family of bookworms mm -hmm. that uh, my grandparents read a lot, my parents read a lot, my older brother read a lot, and then ultimately my younger brother and younger sister read a lot. So um, it, it, I, I was primed definitely to fall in love with the written word and loved books uh, before I could read, then once I could read. And I think it was about third grade when it dawned on me that somebody was creating all of those great books that I love so much. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I had a great third grade teacher who really encouraged us not just to read, but to write as well. And um, the first thing that I really strongly remember writing that was totally original, not something that I just had to write for school, was I had read a book where the two main characters were named Molasses and Taffy, mm -hmm. which as a kid who loved candy and anything sweet, I thought those were great names. And I really enjoyed that particular book. And then I finished the book. It wasn't part of a series. That was it. And mm -hmm. I felt like I was really disappointed that I wasn't going to get to hang out with those two characters anymore. And, uh, you know, I could have gone back and reread the book, but I'd read it thoroughly enough that I, I knew it all, or I didn't know it all, but, you know, I, I already had a sense of what had happened. And it occurred to me that I could write more myself about molasses and taffy and to be a way to continue hanging out with those characters. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nowadays that would be called fan fiction. Uh, right. I'm so old that that wasn't, you know, nobody had dreamed of that term. It was just, uh, oh, okay, you're writing on your own. Go ahead. That's fine. <laughs> and um, so that was one of the earlier things that I did. And then after that, I had a, a lot of stories that I made up on my own. And because I do have a younger brother and younger sister, I would tell them their stories a lot. And so I should probably give my younger brother and younger sister uh, credit for encouraging me to make my stories wilder and weirder and, uh, you know, kind of trying to keep their interest with those stories. You had a captive audience. You had an I, initial I did, captive audience. I did. Audience. We lived on a farm. So, you know, there weren't, there weren't the kind of, there, it wasn't like there was a neighborhood full of other kids that they could be like, okay, we're out of here. We're going to go play with our other friends. So I did have a captive audience. That's mm -hmm. true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love what you said there about the moment where you realize, hey, books like this that I love come from somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. That's honestly one of the inspirations for me doing this. Um, you, you've done a written interview with me before on a mm -hmm. or not a podcast, a blog once upon a time ago, about yeah. a year or two ago. But it's really nice just to hear a voice or see a face and for students to say, hey, that's that guy that I hang out with in a class. But also he's talking to this person who happens yeah. to have written this book that I've read. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I love that. And I also love the idea of sort of that continuation of the story. We want to read more 
when we find a book that we love. And that's one of the things that you do so well, which is carrying through a series. Um, I remember vividly encountering, it was the film, The Never Ending Story. And I thought, well, this is great. This is fantastic. It will never end. And of course, I was a young person when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, of course, the film ended and I thought, oh, I I thought it wasn't supposed to end. So it's it's great when stories carry on. (laughs) I was a very literal kid. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I thought you made change by cutting up dollars, which fortunately I never tried. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, I appreciate that that series book sort of approach that you yeah. take as well. Good, good. That was actually something um, I I kind of had to be pushed to do that. That initially I did not see myself as a series writer. That I was like, I'm a standalone writer. I I can't write a series. And so uh, it, it really took my editor and my agent saying, we really think you should turn this into a series that it, it took me a while to wrap my head around that. But that is one of the fun things, getting to continue the story of a character after the end of their book. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my next question is sort of inspired by the things that I do every day for a living and the response that I often get from students when we're reading something, uh, students will sometimes say, I'm just not a reader, uh, which sometimes means I choose not to read. I actively choose not to do that. Or maybe sometimes I don't have the skills to do that. And I'm posing this question because, as I said, your your book, Among the Hidden, uh, being one of the primary ones, but uh, all of your books really have spent time on my classroom shelf and my wife's classroom shelf. Um, and you you have a talent for capturing that interest. So I'm curious. That was a lengthy introduction to this question. <laughs> uh, you could tell I've been talking all day. Uh, what do what do you think literacy offers for young readers? Yeah. Um, well, if I can back up a little bit, I mm-hmm. I, I want to say that it makes me so sad to hear kids say I'm just not a yeah. reader, and mm-hmm. and I'm sure it it breaks your teacher's heart with that statement too. Um, And I know that there can be a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because there's an issue that has made reading really difficult for them. And Mm -hmm. you don't, you know, things that you're not good at, it's really hard to get excited about doing. I totally get that. And, and I appreciate that there are ways to help students with that ability. Um, When it's uh, the, the thought is, I just don't like it, that that's not who I am. Um, Mm -hmm. I really do believe there's a book for every kid and, and I want so badly, I, I know this is kind of a trendy thing in education or has been a trendy thing in education, like sticking the word yet mm-hmm. on the back mm-hmm. of every sentence that I, I really want those kids to, instead of think, I'm not a reader, I'm not a reader yet. Like there's mm-hmm. still a possibility they will find the right book that will transform them into that because I think reading is so important. Um, I think it is really necessary to function in the modern world, um, to not be fooled or taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really important for our democracy and our civilization itself (laughs) that people are able to read. I can remember when my son was in seventh grade And in Ohio, the history that they study at that point, it includes, um, you know, ancient times. Mm -hmm. And he kind of going through that phase where it was the Mycenaeans and the Minoans and the ancient Greeks and, you know, that kind of era, which I have to say is not my favorite era of history myself. And part Mm -hmm. of that is because I didn't get a good foundation of it when I was my son's age. But I can remember kind of helping him study and I, you know, like doing flashcards, that kind of thing. And it struck me as I was doing that. And probably some teacher along the way had instructed me of this, but it hadn't really hit or sunk in with me. It struck me how many of those ancient civilizations had reading as part of their civilization, that they had a very literate society. And then the civil something happened, like often it was invasions, often it was ongoing warfare, you know, something happened and then they lost the ability to read. It's Mm -hmm. like it had been a literate society and then it wasn't a literary literate society. And then very quickly that civilization was no longer a civilization. 
Uh And, and to me, that was very stark as an illustration of what we can lose if we're not making sure that people can read Uh, on a societal basis, but on an individual basis, it's such a loss for people not to have that. And when I think about what I have gained from being able to read, learning about other cultures, other religions, other parts of the world, you know, people in history, potentially people in the future, like what the future might be like. It gives me the ability to dream for the future. It gives me the ability to to understand where we've come from and hopefully not make the same mistakes that people have made in the past. I, I mean, I just think there's so much that we get from that. And, and, and yes, there are other ways to get some of it, but the thing that I think is really special about a book is the way that it puts you in a character's head Uh and you're not looking at them from outside like you do if you're watching a movie or a TV show or a YouTube video, um, but you feel like you are that person. Uh If it's a well-written book, you can put yourself in that character's shoes. And I think that's essential to developing empathy. And I think if we don't have empathy for one another, again, we're lost as a society. So I know I'm like all over the place in that answer, but that's because I think there are so many benefits from reading. Well, I I love it. And I love this idea of being thoughtful, both as far as being critical about ideas and, and making sure that the ideas that we subscribe to are solid ideas, but also that idea that being intelligent, being critical also means you're most likely a kinder person for the bargain. I love that. And and it it does break the teacher's heart to hear I'm not a reader, but I'm also, I'm with you on the word yet. And and I also take it as a challenge and it's kind of like, I'll find the book for you. We will find a book. (laughs) Um, so yeah, that, I, I appreciate yeah. your, your answer it's very much. Teachers and librarians who feel that challenge, who take, <laughs> I'm not a reader as, oh, just you wait. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Have you seen this book? Have you seen that book? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Try to resist this one. Right. Try it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so much of what you write is, is speculative and it's, uh, sometimes dystopian and, uh, mm-hmm. I love that sort of fashioning in a story where a character is just bobbing along living life and all of a sudden they discover that there's more going on under the surface than they realize which lines up so well with what you were saying about critical thinking and really considering the world around us um with that in mind you're welcome to to say more about the direction that leads you there but i'm also curious about what inspires you to write in in sort of an all ages space? (laughs) I I thought that was an interesting question because when you said that that was one that you're going to be asking me, Mm -hmm. because uh, I am certainly happy to have anybody of any age read my books, but you know, kind of the way publishing works, they do put things into silos a little bit. Yes. So I have books that are technically for ages six to 10 and then Mm -hmm. books that are for age, ages eight to 12 and then 12 and up. And then I think one of them technically is labeled either 13 and up or 14 and up. So I kind of have that range and, um, I am really grateful. And I think I think it was really the Harry Potter book that started this. I'm grateful yeah. that there are more adults reading kids books too. Mm-hmm. And um, it, because there's such a wealth of children's literature out there that it's great that, it, that people of all ages might come to it and discover things that maybe they missed as a kid, or maybe it wasn't written yet when they were a kid. Mm-hmm. And I, I think- we're all better people if we retain something of the inner child within ourselves, not, not being childish and immature, but (laughs) having that sense of wonder and awe about the world. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And um, I know sometimes the the term middle grades book is used or young adult. And I just Mm -hmm. think about like, you might have an upper elementary kid who's ready and willing and able to tackle a book that's a little challenging for them. Or you might have a, a kid who's maybe 
further along in middle school that is ready for a young adult novel and can mm-hmm. tackle some of those questions. And then you might have a person like me who's mm-hmm. middle aged and just tries to read it all. Um, right. So, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I try to send that message of it's good to read YA. <laughs> it, it's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I also like to ask about next creative steps, the sort of worlds that you're thinking about. Uh, and that's sort of, I guess it's the unofficial plug portion of the talk, oh. um, <laughs> if you would like, or or if you just oh, want to yeah. generally talk through any any sure, pieces of what you're thinking. Sure. Well, I, I think probably um, I, I would make my publisher happy if I also talk about like what just came out. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll even do a little show and tell here that I you love the stack. Been- Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had mentioned running out of time as, you know, early on as a book that was discovered, and it actually was my very first book that was published. Um, it has just been reissued with a brand new cover. So this is what mm-hmm. the new cover looks like. And the reason it was reissued was that I just did a sequel to Running Out of Time, which is called Falling Out of Time. Mm-hmm. And um it's a little odd to write a sequel, although we're technically calling it a companion book because it can be read on its own as well as as a, a companion to running out of time. But uh, it, it's a little odd to do that 28 years after the original book came out. I love it. I love it. But uh, it was really fun to do that. And uh, I was saying that to somebody else recently and they pointed out, now I'm going to forget who it was, uh, a- another author waited like 40 years <laughs> to do a sequel to a book. And, and so I'm like, okay, okay. I'm not the only one, uh-huh. but it's kind of a next generation uh, connected to running out of time. And so, so my excuse is, you know, I had to let a certain amount of time pass to get to the next generation, but uh, it, it was really fun to return to that world and and kind of also think about the changes since the 1990s in terms of, I I had a lot of teachers, especially saying to me that I should update running out of time and move it from the modern day being the 1990s to having it be set in the modern world. And I actually realized that I didn't think that that was possible, that things have changed so much since the 1990s that it would be a totally different book. And it, it, I couldn't, it just wasn't possible, which was kind of a devastating realization. <laughs> um, and it made me feel really old, but that is falling out of time was kind of my answer in some ways to that. And it was, it was a very fun thought exercise for me to do. And, and I've gotten great feedback about it. So I'm hoping readers enjoy it a lot too. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to touch on, and I, I <laughs> promise I'm not, whoops, I just, dropped one of the books. So I'm definitely not talking about that one, but uh, uh, I, I'm not talking about every single book. This I will mention this other series of uh, mm-hmm. Mysteries of Trash and Treasure. This is the first book, The Secret Letters. And it is about two kids who start finding shoe boxes full of letters that other kids wrote 50 years ago in attics in their hometown. Love it. So there's a mystery connected to all of that that they have to solve. And it, it, there are actually a couple different mysteries that they have to solve in this book. Uh, the next book that I have coming out, which is due out September 12th of this year, it's called The Ghostly Photos, and it is the sequel to The Secret Letters. And then what I'm working on right now is the third book in that series, and it will be finishing the whole series off called The, the Stolen Key. <laughs> and I'm in the midst of revising that book right now, and it'll come out in the fall of 2024. So that's kind of, I'm finishing up a lot of things. This book that's coming out in September is actually my 50th published book. Wow. So congratulations. I, I'm really feeling like I need to celebrate and, yeah. and also thank all the readers and teachers and librarians and booksellers and you know parents, <laughs> everybody who's made it possible for me to have this career that I'm very grateful to get to do something that I really love. Uh-huh. So that's, that's kind of my whole spiel there. <laughs> well, I love it. I love the mystery genre as well. And I love um, falling out of time is set in, is it 2139, something it, like that? Well, it's a, uh, oh, 
let me give you the right 2193 sorry 2193 2193 yes. yeah you, um, you were very close i i tried i tried the numbers yeah yes yeah um so i i love those stories that again cause us to look at the world in different ways um and sometimes that's through mystery sometimes that's through science fiction or whatever it happens to be uh and i'll also say on the teacher side uh and librarian side sending gratitude for the books for the 50 publications oh, well, and you. more to come yeah th there's nothing more wonderful few things more wonderful in teaching than to point out the classroom bookshelf and say you know have a look there there's got to be something here for you and uh, that's a it's a wonderful thing to take author voices to classrooms with us as teachers. So sending the love and the gratitude right back to you. So mute collaboration society here. That's right. That's right. Um, so the final, final question, and then we can hit anything that we've missed. And that is any events that you want to mention in correspondence with the release of the book, as well as which is September 12th, you said. Um <laughs> as well as web spaces where people can connect and things of that nature, school visits, the, those sorts of things. Um, with the release of the book, I am going out on book tour and it, I'm kind of hopscotching all over the place. I will be in, let me see if I can get this correct in, in my listing of things. Um, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Jackson, Mississippi, and a mystery location that I'm not allowed to mention yet. So ah. <laughs> just to be mysterious about a mystery. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it will be confirmed soon and I will be allowed to mention it, but not quite yet. And then I will also be doing events. Um, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and I'll be doing an event uh, the following week in a suburban Columbus in a suburb at, at a, a library in Grove City, Ohio. And um, so those are all events that are coming up. I'm going to be, since you're North Carolina, this is mm -hmm. this is a good thing to mention. I'm going to be at Epic Fest in Charlotte in November. And then I have school visits kind of all over the place this fall that Wonderful. it's I, I kind of you know, over the, over the pandemic, there were a couple years that I was just doing a lot of virtual visits and really mm -hmm. missed having the contact with kids and, and being in classrooms and, uh, you know, in, in having interaction with readers. And so it's very nice to be back out getting to do those things again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, um, NCTE is in Columbus, Ohio. It is. It is. It's going to yeah. be here in November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so did we miss anything in the talk through that you want to make sure to share? And I think I hit on the points that I wanted to make, but um, it, if there's something else <laughs> that I haven't said, let me know. <laughs> uh, the only other thing that I can think of is those web spaces for people oh, to thank connect. You. Thank <laughs> you. I totally spaced on that. Um I do have a website. It's haddocksbooks.com. That is a, has a lot of information. If you are, a, say, a teacher wanting to use the book, one of my books in the classroom, or you have a lit circle that's doing one of my books, um, for many, many, many of my books, I have links on the on the website or just things embedded in it that are discussion guides. And many of those discussion guides are things that professional educators have put together uh, on behalf of the publishing company. And they just have really good information and really good questions that are thought provoking that would be useful to do with book clubs or, you know, whatever context that you've got. So that's an excellent resource. And it's, you know, I can say that those are really good discussion guides because I'm mm -hmm. not the person who came up with them. <laughs> and, uh, and and it's funny because when I get those, sometimes I look at the questions. And I'm like, that's a really good question. I would like to hear what people think about this. I would like mm -hmm. to be part of that discussion. How fun. But um, so I hope, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you're mm -hmm. trying to bring these into the classroom or, you know, have kids talk about them. So it's it's good to have those as resources. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's really nice not to have to make everything from scratch. I'll yes, I'll yes. link the website. Um, it'll pop up about right now in the video. As a matter of fact. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. 
All right. Well, well, thank you so much, Margaret Peterson Haddix, for taking some time to talk with me and glad to talk with you anytime. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I hope the rest of your school year goes great. I'm well, glad you your so first much. day went well. <laughs> it did. It did. It was a good first day. I have wonderful students. So, yeah. That's excellent. So, okay. Thank you.